In early 2023, my sister and I decided to book some tickets for a trip to Japan following the country's reopening to tourism post-COVID. This was my first time out of the United States, so we had to have our passports registered, flights and hotels booked in advance, and a thorough understanding of what to and not to bring into the country. And finally, in late May, after a lot of planning, we boarded a flight from New York City to Haneda Airport in Tokyo. It would be two weeks and three cities. This is a mini-series on our trip with hopefully some helpful advice on how to enjoy and navigate your own stay in Japan. But without further ado, let's get right into it. The first day in Japan, it rained a lot, an early indication of the upcoming typhoon season that occurs every year during the summer months. Maybe not the most hospitable time to walk around Tokyo, but we were so excited to see the city that we bought a very nice little umbrella at a mini-mart and went outside anyway. Now, there are seemingly thousands of places to eat in Japan, especially in Tokyo, but for cost-saving measures, we ended up booking a hotel that offered free breakfast. And I gotta say, it was pretty good. It offered a blend of Eastern and Western cuisine, so they had small rice dishes with a side of scrambled eggs and orange juice. To be honest, it was a good way to fuel up for the morning. With some breakfast finished, we headed out of the hotel around 11 and got on the subway. Now, if you stay in Tokyo for any period of time, chances are you're going to need to pass through train stations, which are everywhere. You can pick up a Suiko or Pasmo card with some yen, which will allow you to have easy access to the subways throughout most of Tokyo and other cities, as well as some restaurants and convenience stores. Plus, if you register your name and passport information on the card, you can usually have the balance transferred directly to a new one if you happen to lose it while traveling, so the card is a pretty safe bet every time. The station's also a really good place to grab a quick bite from one of the many food areas, which serve up confections, breads, sushi, drinks, curry, noodles, and any variety of things that might tempt your palate. The food can be relatively inexpensive and decent in quality. Also, many of the signs are in English and Japanese, so it made things a bit easier anytime we needed something clarified. Just keep in mind that in many stations and Tokyo in general, there aren't many trash cans or public seating areas, so you'll have to carry whatever trash you have until you can find a proper place to throw it away, and there are lots of cafes where you can rest for a while if you need to sit down. It's not a big deal, but definitely something to keep in mind when you visit. Since it was raining, we decided to focus our first day in Ueno Park and the Tokyo National Museum, which houses several galleries, shops, and gardens around its sprawling campus. Check-in didn't take too long in person, and it was really nice since we were able to store our umbrella safely at the entrance in one of the racks. Now, we spent a lot of time looking through the museum's incredible collection, which stretches across the various exhibition spaces and through multiple buildings. I was pretty amazed by the size of the whole thing and the variety of the property in general. Now, outside, the museum is surrounded by large gardens, which looked absolutely breathtaking in the soothing atmosphere of the morning rain. After a few hours, we departed the museum and felt like stretching our legs a bit, and to be honest, we really couldn't have been in a better spot for it. Nestled in the centrally located district of Taito City, Ueno Park is home to various shrines and temples as well as a large pond, a zoo, and multiple museums lining its borders. Oh, and there's also a Starbucks if you want to get a frappuccino or something. It's easy to spend hours walking the park, and with the rain many of the tourists were absent, which meant the usually crowded places were now left to the peaceful frolicking of cats or chirping of birds, of which there were many. At this point, evening was beginning to fall, so we decided to leave Ueno, have some dinner, and head back to the hotel to rest for the next day. The next morning, the rain ended and the skies cleared, and we boarded the train for the Tokyo Sky Tree as I was eager to get a good view of the city. Standing at 364 meters tall, or 1,080 feet, Tokyo Skytree is currently the tallest tower in Japan and one of the tallest in the world, offering 360-degree views that stretch across the vast skyline and beyond to the mountains and the sea. Of course, there are many cheaper and more accessible alternatives available for city viewing, but I felt it was worth the money to see it as a first-time visitor, and I wasn't disappointed. At the base of the Skytree, there are many attractions, shops, and eateries to experience as well as an aquarium. 
We went through a Ghibli store that's located in the area, bought some cute and interesting merchandise, and then headed for Asakusa, a place I've wanted to visit for years. Since Tokyo is such a walkable city, we were able to cut through the beautiful Sumida Park on our way to the Sumida River Walk, which runs right alongside Asakusa. Here we stopped for some ice cream and then headed into the busy Sensoji Temple, bustling with people from all walks of life. Now Sensoji Temple's earliest structure dates back to the year 645, when the chief of the then small village converted his home into a religious structure in order to house a sacred golden statue of Kanon that was discovered by two brothers in the Sumida River years before. Through the centuries, the temple has been reshaped, remodeled, renovated, and rebuilt as people from all over have traveled to see it, and today it stands as a symbol of rebirth and peace in Japan, as well as Tokyo's oldest religious building. It's hard to describe the feeling of walking around the temple grounds, but it's pretty incredible and something best experienced in person. The classical architecture blends beautifully with the many folks enjoying the cool evening air and traditional yukata, and further down, Nakamise Dori was flooded with all ranges of merchandise, eager to sell you a small piece of what makes the area so special. Me? Well, I bought this cute little rabbit charm because, well, I like bunnies if you can tell. Evening in Asakusa was beautiful, and since stations are everywhere, it was easy to get back to Akihabara Station, where a few blocks away we enjoyed some affordable and delicious curry. Oh, and on another note, I would avoid going through Akihabara or any other large stations during peak hours. As the trains get so cramped, you're usually pressed up against everyone quite unceremoniously, and there is a bit of pushing and shoving going on. So if you're claustrophobic or don't like big crowds, it's best to avoid the busy stations during rush hour, which can vary depending on the day, but are generally crowded from 7 to 9 a.m. and 5 to 7 or 8 p.m. We ended up getting back to the hotel around 9 in the evening and got some needed rest for the next day, but at least from someone not used to it, the subways can get a bit stressful. Day 3. We got some buns for breakfast at a Via de France in Akihabara Station before we ventured into the anime and electronic capital of the world. Now, it was admittedly sad to see the iconic Sega sign gone from the central arcade building, but even so, Electric Town felt more lively than ever. If you ever need a fix for a hobby that exists on Earth, this is the place to go. It's very crowded and many of the prices are high, but just the experience of seeing it in person is absolutely worthwhile. I bought some posters and I had to get a few anime figures as well because one, they were cheaper here, and two, if I'm going to spend money on literal PVC, this is the PVC I would choose to spend it on. Just the Radio Kaikon building alone housed about a dozen anime shops, and then we skipped over to Mandarake and the Animate store before I tried to play a crane game and failed miserably. And finally, how would our trip to Japan's premier otaku town be complete without a visit to one of the many maid cafes that line the streets of Akiba? I don't know, man. And that is precisely why we had to try it out. Originally, I wasn't too sure, but after being pressured by my good friends at home, thanks guys, I puckered up some weird sense of courage, put on my weeb hat, and entered maid heaven. In all honesty though, it was a great and very enjoyable experience. I went to the first Maid Dream In Cafe in Akihabara and we reserved a table for an hour. The maids there were really cute and had all of these neat little routines. They'd come up to the tables and talk to you periodically in Japanese and a bit of English, and each person could choose one song they'd perform live on a mini stage. I couldn't show too much here because filming was mostly prohibited for privacy's sake, but if you want a laid back, uniquely Japanese experience that is family friendly and pretty wholesome, I definitely go for it. Plus, our package reservation came with a signed post-shot Polaroid, which was pretty great. Now, with the Maid Cafe checked off our list, we headed over to meet up with some friends in the busy shopping district of Ikebukuro. From there, it was a short walk to Sunshine City, a large mall with all kinds of shops and restaurants inside. 
There was also a pop performance going on in the main atrium, which was a brief reminder of the absolute thirst fest I experienced at a 2022 Eric Nam concert in New York City. This one was a lot more tame though, thank god. <laughs> and we soon headed for the Gachapon room, which hosts a massive array of machines selling various sea creatures, cute anime keychains, and whatever the heck this is. I mean, I know they're selling the umbrella hats, but what is with these displays? On another note, it's always good to have a lot of 100 yen coins on you when you enter the Gacha Fortress, or use one of the many coin exchange kiosks around the place to get some more of that light gambling fuel. Now other than the shopping, Ikebukuro is home to some university campuses in addition to its many affluent neighborhoods, and away from the main streets you can find a small variety of intimately peaceful sections of town. We found ourselves interacting with some stray cats in the evening, and as the sun went down we set our sights on getting something to eat. The area pretty much has every restaurant you can possibly imagine, but I was on a pilgrimage to find some delicious ramen. So nestled in a tight corner of a neon lit strip of traditional facades and new age high rises, we found a small Tekaipin ramen shop and sat down for a savory meal. Even if you don't speak any Japanese, Tenkaipin has an easy to read menu and in most cases, with a little help you really can't go wrong with any of the choices. I got a combo plate myself and the noodles were outstanding, plus the chicken was perfectly moist and the broth was a perfect ending to a long day. For a foreigner like me, this was a dream come true, to be eating steaming ramen at night, looking outside of Tokyo glistening brilliantly under the night sky. Of course, we had to get back on the trains as well afterwards, which even around 10pm can be completely packed. Still, getting back to our hotel, we made a cohesive plan for the second leg of our trip, the one where we'd be visiting Kyoto, two and a half hours south of Tokyo by the Shinkansen. And that's where I'll leave it for now. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this little adventure, and we'll be continuing it in part two. Until then, thanks so much for watching.